Welcome to the Help, I Have a Narcissist in My Life podcast. I'm Laurel Slade-Wagoner. Episode 52, Common Malignant Attitudes of the Narcissist and How They Develop, Part 2. Once again, I want to start out by saying a big thank you to all of you regular listeners. Thank you all for listening and for also emailing me with notes of encouragement, your questions, and sharing your hearts and what you're going through. I know it takes a lot of time and courage to send those emails, and I am very, very grateful that you do that. Your pain is not unheard, and it's not disregarded. Every single day, please know that I lift each listener and email subscriber up in prayer to our Heavenly Father to strengthen and give hope to. If you're new to this podcast, welcome, and know that I am now praying for you as well. As I stated in part one of this podcast, clinical narcissism is extremely complex, and there's a vast amount of material to cover, especially regarding malignant narcissistic attitudes and how those attitudes develop. I apologize in advance if I overwhelm you with dry clinical information or if I make the information difficult to follow. I'm just so excited to share what I've been blessed enough to learn. Knowledge of narcissism gave me immense freedom from self-condemnation in my own healing journey, and that's what I want for you, precious listeners, freedom and healing. Okay, moving on to today's topic, Common Malignant Attitudes of the Narcissist and How They Develop, Part 2. In part one, the focus revolved around the internal world of the narcissist and what leads to the creation of a narcissistic malignant attitude. In this episode, part two, the focus will be on a few of the common narcissistic malignant attitudes and how they can be recognized. Remember from part one, what is in your narcissist will most definitely expose itself behaviorally and attitudinally. This reality was foretold in the Bible thousands of years ago. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Luke 6.45 I know that it stinks having to do all of this researching and learning about narcissism, especially since your narcissist is probably doing nothing to grow as a person and surrender what is causing you, and possibly others, so much pain. A word of caution out of love for you, precious listeners. Using this information to try to show your narcissist that he or she has a malignant narcissistic attitude will only cause you to experience added frustration and suffer further rejection. Remember, clinically narcissistic, biblically foolish individuals refuse to add to their learning and see things from a different perspective. Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions, so says Proverbs 18.2. The Holy Word gives clear warning of what will happen to us if we bring a narcissist, a fool, any correction. Whoever corrects a mocker invites insults. Whoever rebukes rebukes the wicked incurs abuse, Proverbs 9.7. Insults and abuse. That's what a narcissist will give you in return for your wisdom. Please remember that and resist confronting your narcissist on his or her malignant attitude. But don't despair. Although this knowledge will not motivate your narcissist to change, there is, however, a big healing blessing for you in gaining knowledge about narcissism and narcissistic malignant attitudes. Once you can identify your narcissist's malignant attitude, you can then renew your mind with the truth that his or her malignant attitude is not consistent with biblical instruction or Christ's attitude. Renewing your mind with this truth will then assist you in guarding your heart with the understanding that the source of the toxicity and his or her triggers for controlling and abusive behavior are coming from your narcissist's malignant attitude and not from you, even though he or she may be projecting blame onto you. Before diving into a few common narcissistic malignant attitudes, let's first clarify what is meant by the word attitude. An attitude is an enduring evaluation and judgment of others, self, circumstances, God, and the world at large. A person's attitude is his or her viewing lens. It is a filter from which all experiences get sifted through and assigned a judgment. We all have attitudes. For example, I would say my general attitude is based on the law of reaping and sowing. I see things through that lens. Hard work results in receiving a blessing. 
This attitude gives me a continual flow of hope and that there is always something to do that can bring forth change. Even if it's just prayer, there's always something to do that will provide a blessing. Sometimes, though, the blessing isn't obvious to me, so I pray that I can recognize the blessing and perceive it as such. Because of my we reap what we sow attitude that has become ingrained in me, we reap what we sow has become a divine promise to me, since we reap what we sow is articulated in Galatians 6-7. This attitude brings me great joy, in that it allows me to help others fervently search their own lives for things they can do to reap empowerment and healing blessings. But at other times, this attitude causes me to experience deep sadness and even anger when I witness others, especially others whom I love, making repetitive, irresponsible, or disrespectful choices that reap a harvest of long-term difficulty for them or other people. A person's viewing lens or attitude comes from a combination of his or her core beliefs, opinions, perceptions, and emotions which are usually formed during a person's childhood and adolescent years based on their experiences and close interpersonal influences. These attitudes have the ability to change over time if the person habitually chooses different experiences and different interpersonal influences than what he or she had during her, his or her formative years. Instead of allowing their attitudes to change and be molded more into what Christ's attitude is through the prog- progressive process of sanctification, the pursuit of new experiences and exposure to healthy influences, narcissists stay stuck in their childlike attitudes. They cling to their self-centered, entitled, immature way of viewing things, which becomes malignant and abusive to others by the time they reach adulthood. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit, so says Luke 644. When trying to discern the presence of a narcissistic malignant attitude in your narcissist, Pay careful attention to his or her words and gestures. Try to identify a consistency and a pattern to his or her language. You're looking for a pervasive toxic tone or undercurrent that is ever present regardless of the topic at hand. What is revealed in his or her language are signposts that reveal his or her malignant attitude. While this list is not all-encompassing, the following are the three most common malignant narcissistic attitudes that I have witnessed in my professional experience counseling narcissists and victims of narcissistic control and abuse. Malignant attitude number one, an attitude of chronic cynicism. The chronic cynic continually thinks the worst, the worst about circumstances, about outcomes, and about other people and their motives. Chronic cynics give off a vibe of jaded negativity and persistently complain and express frustration. They are easily disillusioned, pessimistic, skeptical, and can be downright scornful. They very rarely express joy or gratitude and often have just a sour personality. They view other people as selfishly motivated and cannot see the integrity and the goodness of others. Since chronic cynics see circumstances and other people as not meeting of their expectations, it isn't on their radar to ever apologize. They have a double standard mentality and hold others accountable for what they will not hold themselves accountable for. And when others fail to meet their expectations, these chronic cynics condemn their perceived victimizers, either inwardly to themselves or outwardly through habitual criticism, nitpicking at their alleged offenders, or more aggressively through slandering their victims to whomever will listen. Since, in their eyes, chronic cynics are always 100% right and others are always in the wrong and failing to meet their expectations, They hold fierce grudges and harbor a great deal of hatred in their hearts, which further fuels their cynicism. They are perpetual accusers and leave others in a constant state of doubt and wonderment over how they will fail the cynic next. In severe cases, these chronic cynics struggle with paranoia, which then they use to excuse themselves from seeking out friendship, support, and accountability, as well as exempt themselves from meeting responsibilities. Everyone wrongs them or has the potential to wrong them. No one is to be trusted and no one is good enough, so says the malignant attitude of a a chronic cynic. 
Malignant attitude number two, an attitude of persistent apathy and indifference. Narcissists who have a malignant attitude of persistent apathy and indifference invoke strong emotions of neglect and abandonment in their victims. These narcissists deeply fear and abhor emotional intimacy. Thus, they keep people at an emotional distance. Since they cannot tolerate conflict in addition to not being able to tolerate closeness, these narcissists engage in stonewalling behavior, either by outright refusing to respond when others ask something of them, or by responding with a, yes, I agree, or I will do that, that results in a lack of follow through. This type of chronic stonewalling makes these narcissists Mr. and Mrs. Gonna Do's, which can send victims into an emotional fury as they eagerly wait for the follow through that rarely, if ever, materializes. These chronic apathizers do not do relational work. They are indifferent to the needs of others and don't see the point in investing in relationships. Worse yet, they will condescend people who do. These emotionally underdeveloped narcissists can even have the ability to be completely unresponsive and sit there, still-faced, stone-cold, and void of all emotion while someone else is begging and crying for them to emote and emotionally engage. I've seen this happen a great deal in marriage counseling sessions. Narcissists who have a chronically indifferent and apathetic malignant attitude look at others who are emoting and expressing feelings as if they are raging lunatics. They cannot handle someone else's emotions, so they will commonly tell others who are emoting to calm down or to stop acting irrational. They will go as far as creating smear campaigns against their victims, reporting to anyone who will listen that the emoters in their life are crazy, neurotic, and out of control. To the outside world, these narcissists look like the sane ones, but the victims know better. The victims know the cruel apathy and indifference they repeatedly experience. The Bible instructs us in Romans 12, 15 to rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Narcissists with a malignant attitude of persistent apathy and indifference will not heed this biblical instruction. These narcissists can easily weaponize the redemptive tool of separation and give others the silent treatment for days, months, and years at a time without even being bothered by it. They can suppress and disconnect from pain and conflict and proceed as if nothing were happening, which speaks to the people in their lives that they do not matter to them. Not really and that they are just fine without resolving things and without intimate connection. Others' attempts at connection are often met with expressed frustration because the narcissist views attempts at connection as control, as well as a disruption to what he or she wants, which is to be 100% in control of the amount of closeness in the relationship. Narcissists with a malignant attitude of persistent apathy and indifference just want others to let them be as they are and stop asking for emotional engagement or change. They render themselves emotionally insulated and unconfrontable while rendering their victims powerless, frustrated, and feeling repeatedly rejected by their everything is fine, leave me alone malignant attitude. And finally, malignant attitude number three an attitude of arrogant superiority. Narcissists with a malignant attitude of arrogant superiority have a delusional, overinflated, seemingly confident view of themselves. I believe their narcissistic malignant superior attitudes to be rooted in what psychologist Alfred Adler describes as a superiority complex. Adler postulated that individuals with a superiority complex don't really believe they are superior at all. He believed that their projection of superiority is a defense mechanism that masks the individual's low self-esteem and feelings of inadequacy, and also serves to protect him or her from experiencing shame. I agree with Dr. Adler. Someone who has a superiority complex really has an inferiority complex, albeit hidden. Expanding on Dr. Adler's work, I believe that if someone's superiority complex is pervasive, growing, and habitually weaponized to make others feel one of the many seven I-words, 
which are inadequate, incompetent, incapable, irrelevant, inept, insubstantial, and or impotent in decision making, then that such person has narcissistic personality disorder, and more specifically, has a narcissistic malignant attitude of arrogant superiority. Narcissists with a malignant attitude of arrogant superiority repetitively exaggerate and pontificate their knowledge, their achievements, possessions, abilities, and even status in order to gain admiration. These superiorists project being experts on every single subject they discuss. I don't know will not be something you hear from them. To these narcissists, the words I don't know are bad words. These narcissists either aggressively express their disdain for another person's deficiencies, or they perpetually leak criticism and condescension like a leaky faucet leaks drops of water. They have a high need for control and view other person, another person's lack of agreement as insubordination and possibly a lack of authority. When challenged, they think and may even respond with something like, do you know who you're talking to? Or, no one else talks to me so disrespectfully, why do you? These malignant narcissists can be prone to lashing out in anger or emotionally punishing their victims if they do not receive the admiration, recognition, or respect they believe they are entitled to. They have an intolerance for negative feedback and do not believe anything short of praise could be beneficial to them in any way, since, who are you to give a superior person advice? They are easily aggravated and burn with hate for individuals who receive what they believe they are entitled to, such as being chosen for an award or promotion at work. No one around them is as smart as them, has the knowledge base that they do, drives as good as they drive, loves as good as they love, parents as well as they do, has better ideas than they do, knows more about politics and world affairs, and on and on and on, according to their superiority, that is. In order to get along with a narcissist who has a malignant attitude of arrogant superiority, one must learn to revere him or her, resist challenging him or her on any issue, and revert to taking a childlike stance within the relationship wherein the narcissist knows all and controls all. These narcissists will tolerate nothing less. If you give them less than absolute reverence, you will be replaced by someone or someones who will. In summary, Study your narcissist. Be on the lookout for a pervasive pattern of language and behaviors that reveal his or her malignant attitude. And stay anchored in the truth that none of what he or she is saying is your fault or yours to fix, precious listeners. Healing activity for today. Prayerfully consider the definition of the word attitude. What is your overall general attitude or the lens through which you view yourself, God, the world, circumstance, and others? Now prayerfully consider your narcissist attitude. Is it consistent with any of the three common malignant attitudes discussed? Is there a different malignancy present? Regardless of the type of malignant attitude your narcissist has, what specific truth thoughts do you need to renew your mind with in order for you to know without doubt that his or her malignant attitude is not your doing and not yours to fix? Some power scriptures to keep in mind. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Luke 6.45 Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. Proverbs 18.2 Whoever corrects a mocker invites insults. Whoever rebukes the wicked incurs abuse. Proverbs 9.7 each tree is recognized by its own fruit. Luke 6.44 Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Romans 12.15 There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1 As always, I'd like to end with a short prayer for all of you listeners. Powerful Jesus, just thank you so much for loving us and and being our strength, Lord. 
thank you for your holy word that truly is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path when we feel like we are surrounded by so much narcissistic darkness, Lord. I lift up each of the listeners to you. Please help them. Please help them understand that they are loved and that they are precious. And when they are wearied by their narcissist malignant attitude, Lord, please give them strength and the ability to resist their narcissist vile, disgusting projections and distortions, Lord. Satan is the accuser and uses narcissists to accuse your beloved people of so many untrue things. Please just render Satan powerless in the lives of each precious listener, Lord, and render their narcissist control and abuse powerless too. In the name of Jesus, I ask this. Uh, We love you. Amen. Please make sure to subscribe to this podcast and leave a quick rating and review wherever you are streaming this podcast. Thank you to all of the people who have taken the time to subscribe and rate the podcast. Your kindness just overwhelms me so much. The ratings and reviews help me tremendously when I'm writing future podcasts and also books. You can also email me directly at lslade4 at verizon.net. That's L-S-L-A-D-E, the number four at verizon.net with your questions or topics that you would like addressed in the upcoming podcast. As I stated in the introductory podcast, this podcast series is for you listeners and I want to address the issues that you need addressed. I will incorporate your questions into my upcoming podcasts, as well as information from my book, Don't Let Their Crazy Make You Crazy, and also the second book I wrote for parents called Don't Let Their Crazy Make Your Kids Crazy. If you have any questions about me or my services or like any information on either of the books, then feel free to visit my website, uh, slade-wagonercounselingservices.com. That's S-L-A-D-E dash W-A-G-G-O-N-E-R counseling services.com. You can also purchase the books in either paperback or ebook format on that website. And also on the website, you can subscribe to be part of the email community to receive updates on future podcasts and books, as well as a free monthly tool that may help you to stay sane and strong. Again, that website is slade-wagonercounselingservices.com. May God bless you abundantly. I love you guys.